Hi, everybody. Thanks for um, being with us this afternoon. Um, Nicholas Negroponte, uh, who was the director of the MIT Media Lab and founded the One Laptop Per Child program, is on my left. And uh, Jessica Rosenworcel, who is an FCC commissioner, is also on my left. And um, you know, my, fir my first thought is, uh, this is about connecting the last one billion people, except as soon as I got into this, I realized that um, we have more than one billion people who are not connected. Um, I think 90% of the people in the poorest 48 countries are not connected. The number I see that most frequently used is that 57% of the people in the entire world are not connected. Um, the UN has this goal of reaching 60% of the people with the internet by 2020. Um, I saw that only 5% of the world's 7,100 languages are accessible via the internet. And um, the numbers go on. Um, I, I, another interesting number that I saw is that 50% fewer women have access than men have access uh, to the internet in sub-Saharan Africa. So I guess it's, it's doubly disconnected. I, I thought I'd ask um, Nicholas and Jessica to start. Um, maybe Nicholas could give us a long view of where we've been and where we're going, and then perhaps um, Jessica could talk a little bit about the di digital di divide in the United States, and then if you want to talk about more broadly. But maybe, Nicholas, could you talk about where we are? Sure. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I, I, I view it as the whole world, and, and, and the United States is a particular condition, a very special condition, in fact, a very lucky uh, country in the way it's worked out for connectivity. Uh, in the rest of the world, it's, it's, it's not quite like that. My main point, and I'll give it to you right at the beginning, is that the internet shouldn't be affordable. It should be free. And that's a very fundamental point. Whether you call that a human right or a civic responsibility, I don't want to get into human rights arguments, but there are a certain number of things that are free to all of us. They cost something. That doesn't seem they're costless. And by making them more affordable, the government or whatever entity is paying for them obviously can do a lot better. But it should be free, like sidewalks, lighting on streets, roads, certain things that we consider part of our infrastructure. And most people find that scandalous because the people around the table, when you go to the meetings, whether it's in the United Nations or places like this, um, actually believe this is a business. And if you look at the 10, 15 richest people in the world and where they made their money, guess what? A lot is telemarketing telecommunications. When you treat it as a business, as we do in this country, AT&T and Verizon spend $5 billion on advertising, and roughly the equal number swap from one to the other at the end of the year. So that's $5 billion that didn't go into the network. Uh, you see competitive practices used around the world, which cost a fortune. And most, pe most countries don't have what they could have if it was considered as a civic responsibility instead of a commercial opportunity. The history of telecommunications explains why we are where we are, because it originated when telephony was about voice and it was sort of just being started at the beginning of the last century. Long distance phone calls especially were for the rich. It was a little bit like tobacco and alcohol. The people who could afford to do that were subsidizing the people who had a more local uh, need or more local requirement. If you traveled in Africa and you were in, let's say, Uganda, and you wanted to make a phone call to Kenya, which is like calling from, from Utah to California, it was considered not just a long distance phone call, but it was invariably $10, $20 a minute. Government owned the phone companies, and it was in many of those governments the highest form of hard currency income to that company. So it was the, the like tobacco and alcohol, people who made those long distance phone calls were paying, the country was making a lot of money. Until in history, and very few people realize that the privatization of telecoms, and I'll use Europe as the historical landmark, and the invention of wireless were at the same time. 
They happened at the same time in history. So guess what? When people wanted to privatize the state-owned phone companies, and I'm going to use Europe because it's a perfect example, they gave out licenses. They gave out cell phone licenses. And in the beginning of cell phone licenses, including the United States, uh, but in the very beginning, they were given out on the basis that was pejoratively called a beauty contest, who, made, who offered the state the best sort of deal. And then they got rid of those in favor of just sheer money. And Germany did, I think, the first one. England did the second. And they started to realize that the country could earn four or five billion dollars by giving a license. So the African countries, they were using long distance to pay themselves, if you will. And they said, aha, we have a windfall here. We can start selling our spectrum. Imagine, this is a public good. It's like selling Central Park. We're not going to keep Central Park. We're going to sell it. And they sold Spectrum, took in money to pay for what was not coming in through taxes, because very little of developing world really earns money through taxes. And guess what? The people who paid for it had to earn their money back. And it just it proceeded as a business. And as an aside, those businesses tend to print money. I have friends who own cell phone companies in various parts of the world, and they print money. Cash just pours out of these things, and that cash doesn't go back into the network. So I come along and I say to, to somebody in head of state that, that really connectivity is education. And if you were to connect your country, that's what's going to elevate society. And I don't think I get much argument anymore. I think people agree the connectivity and education, whether it's as one-to-one -one as I think or it's sort of one-to-one, -one, it's, it's true enough. So we are at a cusp, and that's the part, and I can discuss it. We're at a cusp in history where we have to stop the trend of doing this all as a commercial competitive business and start the trend, and I'll tell you what I'm doing about later, so start the trend of thinking of this as a way of elevating all of society, it's a civic responsibility, and perhaps even a human right. And I'll okay. stop there. Good, thank you. Um, Jessica, if, could, could you well, talk about that? respond to that? Yes, please. How about that? Okay, sure. that'd be I'm fine. Gonna, well, let's see. You put forward the idea that the network operator model will only take us so far, and there are limitations to it. But what I want to highlight is we have an incredible experiment in this country with free service. And I bet everyone in this room has used it in the last 24 hours. It's called unlicensed spectrum or Wi-Fi. And 30 years ago, the Federal Communications Commission did something. We found we had a handful of airwaves that were designated for industrial, scientific, and medical purposes, but they weren't getting used. We didn't really know what to do with them. So we went to our engineers and said, do you have any ideas? And they came up with an idea that was absolutely radical at the time. Instead of giving individual licenses to companies to go build networks and charge users? What if instead we said that this would be airwaves that would be open to all who played by a set of established rules? So instead of having spectrum be thought of as property like a house that one operator might own and might charge people to come in and use, instead it would be more like the road system where anybody who obeys traffic rules could get on the road. That was just absolutely crazy three decades ago. But the FCC chose to proceed. And a few things happened along the way, like a standard called 802.11. But what came from that is Wi-Fi, which makes its primary home in the 2.4 gigahertz band today. And that has democratized internet access in this country like nothing else. It's a free way to get online. But it's actually even more important than just that, because it has become a way for those operators who have licenses to manage their networks. 
they offload about half their traffic onto Wi-Fi at some point. And even better, it has become a place for innovation. We are incorporating wireless service into everything we do. The Internet of Things is around the bend. But incorporating unlicensed spectrum into your devices doesn't require the permission of any operator. You just have to obey by the rules. And so I do think that we have models out there that democratize access and allow for free online opportunity. And in the United States, at least, Wi-Fi is a tremendous example. Well, I was one of the inventors of it. it was, ISM was established in 1947. Yeah. Um, and I remember, and I love it. And in fact, if the FCC could do something, is stop giving operators more license, more oh, band, well, more make more open spectra. Oh, no, so I'm a absolutely. great believer. But look what happened to Wi-Fi. I wrote a paper about 20 years ago called The Water Lily and the Frog. And it was how these Wi-Fi things would grow. And yours would overlap with mine. And then you'd have the frog was you could go from spot to spot. And this would all grow and cover. Now you log in in New York City or anywhere, they're all locked. Why are they locked? The telcos lock them. Because Verizon doesn't want you to share your thing, so they may use it. But it should be, and I've said to previous commissioners, make it illegal for them to lock it. What we also need, and this is sort of amazing, if we want more Wi-Fi in our skies, we have to identify spectrum for, for unlicensed use. But one of the greatest impediments we have is actually congressional budgetary accounting. It's not some like partisan divide. What happens is we have a legislative process that likes spectrum policy because when licenses are sold at auction, it raises billions and billions of dollars. And in fact, the agency that I work at has collected a, roughly $100 billion in the last 20, 25 years yeah. in its spectrum auctions. And other countries around the world have right. used that's that model. That's part of the problem. And it is definitely yeah. part of the problem because mm. the congressional mm. budgetary accounting for spectrum mm. thinks about the value associated with its sale, not the value to the economy okay. and civic culture writ large. And that is a problem that I actually think we have to start addressing as an accounting matter in order to facilitate That's the availability but, of more spectrum. But can we take this lesson, uh, uh, Nicholas's lesson, and apply it to extending connectivity to the disconnected? What, what, is, so, it, what, is, what is it in the what lesson of the Wi-Fi experience that could take us forward? Well, open spectrum is just a good thing to yes. have. And having more of it is a great thing. And it, it, um, countries, depending on, they're all very different. Some of them are very broad-minded about it, some of them. And, it's, and it actually, by the way, it doesn't have much to do with whether they're democratic or undemocratic or whether these guys are, you know, it, it doesn't, it, there's no correlation of that sort. The real problem, and this is what sort of usually puts me in the corner as, as kind of he can't be that serious, is that the DNA of our planet right now, the structure of it, the design of it, is around this thing called countries. Mm -hmm. Countries, we have 194, 195, depending how you count, um, as a taxonomy is just crazy. The smallest one is under 1,000. The biggest one's over 1.4 billion. They all claim things like sovereignty. Some are big, some are small. Um, then you have to do things over and over again. So my suggestion is go and solve the problem outside of sovereignty. Don't go. You don't. I don't want to go. Even if I'm successful with a country, that I've got to replicate that 93 times and be successful. And some of those countries, like India and China, are so massive. So go above 100 kilometers. Jurisdiction ends at 100. So how does that? How does that play? Give me the scenario satellites. for how that plays. What? Satellites. So yeah. a next generation yeah. of satellite that yeah. might be coming along soon. Yeah. Uh, how does that play out for a country like China? What happens when all of a sudden? Okay. So you, you've got satellites that are flying above Hong Kong. You've got geos, and then Leo's much lower. Um, guess what? They're flying there. They are flying there. The reason a commercial co company needs to talk to China is because China has to give them landing rights if they're running a business. But if I'm not running a business, and I'm just, I, I can honestly say, Every square inch of this planet has 10 megabits. Every square inch. And all you have to do is take a teacup and put it out there. And you've got 10 megabits. 
the country doesn't give me permission. But okay, so let's play that out in the real world. The yeah. Chinese, as a nation, have an anti-satellite capability. Do you think that basically they don't shoot down any of the Leos and the come on, uh, you know, so is it already true? It's yes, all, there's of course already it access. Is. Thousands it's, of them. In fact, it's a classified number as to how many thousands of them there are. And actually, it's tens of thousands of Leos. So this next, so what's necessary on the receiver side, on the device side, to connect to that world as it goes forward? So there are two points, there are two views of that. One view is you go from 100 kilometers directly to the user, which nobody, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, do not advocate. Why do they not advocate? because they want to send their signal to a telecom operator or to an entrepreneur who will be a micro telecom operator. Both of those, I think, are bad ideas. So if you go directly to the user, which is possible, then the only thing that stands between you and connectivity is a minor revolution. So if you're in a remote part of India, who's going to care about your teacup? And, and it'll just emerge, and it'll just grow and be faster and faster. You could launch such a system and cover the whole world for less than two weeks of war in Afghanistan. Okay? <laughs> the world military budget, which is $5 trillion, you can use one-tenth of one percent of it and connect everybody on the planet. So we're farting around selling licenses, telling businesses, do this, do that. Get with it. Let's just do it. There's nothing stopping us Jessica, from doing it except commercial interests. Do, 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 how do you react to that? It's so much fun to be um, next to an iconic contrarian. <laughs> um, I think there's a lot of neat potential in satellites we're starting to explore right now that is different than it used to be, particularly with the low Earth orbiting satellites. And you know, the thing about satellites is they're truly, they're global. They could reach everywhere. But I wouldn't want us to only focus on satellites. I think we should also look at terrestrial opportunities. They're going to be smaller in scale, but I think they deserve energy and effort too. Because even as the cost of shooting satellites into the sky is coming down, it's still a costly enterprise. And I think that one of the opportunities we also have right now exists in white spaces in broadcast television bands. You've been talking to Microsoft. I mean, that's their approach, and it's fine. Fine. Well, and uh, there are it, lots of terrestrial we're doing approaches. We're in the United States, too. I think the idea yeah. there is, you know, look, um, we have a lot of spectrum worldwide that has been dedicated for television. By and large, it's low band spectrum, and you don't have to know very much, but lower band spectrum, the signal goes far. So the economics of deploying on that spectrum are different. You don't have to put up very many towers. And then the question becomes, are there spaces within television spectrum that are unoccupied by stations? And if they are, can we find ways to put those in the hands of local operators or local nonprofits to help cover a community? And I don't think that that is an exclusive idea, but I think we should pursue other ones besides just satellites, and that's an example. Oh. My choice of satellites is I don't know another way to get out of the jurisdiction of a country. True. Once I come below 100 kilometers, and there are a lot of other, yeah. I can do balloons, which is Google. But, I can but do that's drones. Got geopolitical challenges. You know, yeah, the but they're, yeah, they're, yeah, they're, they're down yeah, there. They're down. Right. So balloons are. Drones think, are higher. But they're still within yeah. the 100. They're still within they're the still limits there. of sovereignty. Yeah, they still And also, get there's there. a solar element to them. I'm not sure there's if they work also, off of the equator. But we're getting really nerdy here, aren't we? Yes, well, we are getting nerdy. <laughs> but the point is, is if you stay above this certain limit, you can do things right. without the agreement of countries. But, but connect it to the ground. Connect it to the people who don't have devices. And yeah. how do we use the availability of the spectrum uh, to actually drive adoption? I mean, how do you, the chicken and the egg. The egg is what, I mean, can you actually oh, yeah. talk about your uh, one laptop per child experience and what the, do, you, do you have an answer on what the device should be and how can we get the device to the price where we can get to? I think those questions have gone away. The prices now are so low. Uh, you, get, you can buy tablets for $35 that are perfectly respectable. You can buy laptops for, for 100 that are reasonable, 150 that are good. Um, 
I keep hearing, I went to a couple of sessions, I went to your earlier sessions, I keep hearing the concept digital literacy and I wonder what planet are these people on? Digital literacy. It's like when the car was invented, we're gonna have a combustion literacy program for people to drive cars. What the hell does digital literacy mean? Every kid can use a laptop or a tablet within nanoseconds. Um, and then somebody earlier today Brilliant. said about content. We have, con of course there are issues of content, but Gutenberg didn't write the books. That's somebody else. I'm sort of the Gutenberg analogy. And when I'm trying to connect the world, I'm not worried about who's writing the books. And I know that digital literacy is so easy. We've put tablets in villages that have no literacy, have no adult that's even seen a written word. And kids, within minutes, they've never seen an on-off switch. They can turn on the tablet or the laptop. Within five days, they were singing ABC songs. Within two weeks, they were, they were reading, or at least word reading, and within six months, they hacked Android. There was no teacher in that class. There was nobody who was computer literate or digitally literate. They just discovered it. It's called discovery, and it's very easy. So I want to set that part aside. The devices are sort of solved. Getting the world digitally literate is, is to me, a non-issue. So it's how do you get around this absurd situation we've created, it's of our own doing, it's, and, and it's historically understandable. Nobody was mean-spirited in this, by the way. It's nobody came along and said, oh, this is how I'm gonna do something. No, it just evolved, and we're in a bind now. We're in a bind because people, I forget what the world expenditure on telecoms is. I think it's, I think it's, 1.2 trillion or something, it's, two, it's, 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 hot. it's up like, like 2 trillion. Okay, if you count, you know. And when I say it should be free, probably a lot of that 2 trillion is there, it's just paid for differently. Well, what cost about? Is, cost is a big issue for a lot of the world that's not connected right now, for many of the reasons you just described. Um, the United Nations Broadband Council, I think, came out in 2011 and said, their ideal is that you don't spend more than 5% of your household income on communications. And if that is your metric today, you know, only 43% of the globe could actually afford about 500 megabytes of service. And so the cost structure of communications today is a significant problem. I mean, if we decided, oh, we have some rural area of the globe and they can't get from point A to point B and it's impeding their economy, and we went out and we built them great cars, but they couldn't afford those cars, well, that's not actually a solution. So we have to start thinking about that cost structure if we really want to solve part of this problem. But isn't there sort of a second order effect of connectivity? I and mean, do you buy, uh, Facebook sponsored a recent study by PricewaterhouseCoopers that said that if you connected the world, you get, get $6.7 .7 trillion of added economic output, which I would think would cover any costs that would, I mean, first of all, do you buy that kind of argument that connecting the world creates economic activity and new value? I do, you know, Salo's paradox notwithstanding. Yeah, yeah. I, I do just, you want to, to, to. yeah. You know, everyone always says you can see um, the computer age everywhere except in the productivity statistics. And yet I still think we're in early days of our systems being replaced and digitization and software defined systems changing our economy. And I, and I, and maybe it's just conviction and gut, but I believe we are going to be able to demonstrate enormous economic and civic benefit over time. We just haven't been able to quantify it all that well. So I do believe those kind of statistics. So, and, but, but who are the entities who will invest to reap that benefit? I mean, is, I mean it, it should be free. Who can make it free? And, and oh, it could be made free by the stroke of a pen of, of almost any government. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, so India buys three less F-15s and they've just covered it. Um, you can do this in many, many ways. And I remember going to see Stan McChrystal in <laughs> Afghanistan saying it's going to cost a billion dollars. And he said, that's no problem. <laughs> it's a rounding error for us. OK, so in one, you know, and in three This and is half, in Afghanistan Yes, alone? In, yeah. while, while yeah. in Afghanistan. Yeah. And then Petraeus, whom I also saw when I was there, didn't feel that at all. He said, well, it's not fungible money. And uh, he said, and say hi to your dad. I, I didn't want to tell my brother that, but at any rate, um, it's, it's, uh, 
It's something that can be done at the government level, but what we tend to do is we trivialize it. We make it such a small thing. More people are spending money pouring concrete outside your house to create a sidewalk and sewer systems and bridges. Do you know how expensive bridges and engineering projects are? And we build one to cross this river, to cross mm -hmm. that river, and look at those budgets and compare them to the education budgets and look at the developing countries, and it'd be, it's, it's trivial to add connectivity. Well, and, and you raised um, the spectrum issue, in a, and I wanted to ask you to go a step farther because it, in terms of unlocking value, um, could you talk about this study that was done by the White, for the White House, by the PCAST committee, yeah. about using spectrum in new ways and taking advantage of technologies? Because the, the thing about doing real-time auctions instead of auctioning it once mm -hmm. every what, whatever is they had this argument about unlocking economic activity. They were sort of making the uh, analogy that doing that for our spectrum, using it in different ways, would be like creating another internet. And it would have that kind of economic, I mean, do you believe that? And uh, I mean, what would it take to reuse the spectrum in a really novel way like that? And uh, yeah. could you t take me through the PCAS okay. report? Um, well, I said this earlier today, but yesterday was the nine year anniversary of the iPhone going on sale. And if you, and you contemplate, it. <laughs> yeah, no, if you contemplate how much the world has changed, it's extraordinary. But also for a moment, contemplate how much more you're using wireless services today as a result. We are cramming more and more activity into our skies than ever before. And if our skies are a finite place, we have to figure out how to use them more efficiently. <coughs> Because the thing about our spectrum is we doled it out over time to aviation and to the military in ways that are not especially efficient. So how can we cull some of that back? Or as we create new licensed and unlicensed spectrum, use it more efficiently? And that is what the Presidential Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, that's how you get to PCAST, report was all about. It was saying, well, there used to be this model where we would license spectrum. And whether or not they used it, somebody paid for it, and they could set up a service. And then there was this other model, like unlicensed and Wi-Fi, where everyone could use it as long as they chose to follow some rules. But I think what their idea was about was, what if we have a model in the middle, where instead of just saying it's for everybody or only for licensed, what if we had a model where we had a hierarchy of uses? Because 4G technology with wireless allows us to do that. In other words, we could have some licensing, but to the extent that it's not being used, we could have opportunistic access to that spectrum. And we might, over time, think about how we can have real-time ability through a spectrum access system to determine whether or not you could get access to those airwaves. In other words, we are trying to be a lot more efficient with this scarce resource, and we are now experimenting with that hierarchy model in a spectrum known as a 3.5 gigahertz band. And if we succeed, we are going to have a model we can export internationally, which could make spectrum use worldwide more efficient. If you succeed, could you export to other parts of our spectrum as well? Yes. Um, you know, there are legal challenges there associated with the fact we have licensed spec yeah. spectrum. But I think the idea that you have one user or many users is flawed. We should figure out how, if it is not being used, others can use it. It is, the skies are a public resource. We have to find ways to optimize its use in service of both civic and commercial culture. Yeah. Nicholas, do you have thoughts uh, on this? Uh, a comment and a question. Um, the comment is that if you look at the spectrum, pick the worst city, the densest city, New York City at 5 p.m., and you took a spectrum analyzer mm -hmm. to see what's being used, the answer is almost nothing. Right. Right. It's empty. It's empty for that reason. Mm -hmm. My question is, how much of that's owned by the government? Oh, about, I would say below, that's a really good question, because Starting we have, at, like, stopping say, at four, four gigs. Four, four gigahertz. Sorry, four. I would say that the government probably has veto power over about 60% of the spectrum below four gigahertz. 60%. And I think out of that, if I recall the statistics, 37% of it is at the Defense Department. About 14% is with the Federal Aviation Administration. And what you have to realize is that was based on a policy choice years and years ago 
even worse. To give worse. them spectrum systems I agree. at a time when our demand on our airwaves was not quite as strong. And so now the challenge is how do we cull some of that back so that we have more for our commercial and civic activities, but also compel them to be more efficient with the scarce resource. So let's use as a round number 50% of the government, because use the world government, is, own, sure. is, is owned sure. by the government. And that allocation was made in the 40s and 50s when we had really terrible technology very for- Very inefficient. Very inefficient. That's why television sets have white spaces, because <laughs> right. the the transmission would leak, and so you, you basically, instead of having a highway with a lane, you had these three extra lanes so that, no, it was like drunken drivers driving down. So now you could just be more efficient. Mm -hmm. Let's say we are 10 times more efficient, just to invent a number, and 50% of the bandwidth is owned by the government. It's not a hard formula to figure out how you could maybe repurpose 40% of it and not affect military, not affect fire, but you just well, have to do well, you some know what, engineering. What you have to also do is you have to give federal authorities, to the extent that they have spectrum today, have an incentive to maintain ownership of that spectrum. And so we have to start incentivizing them in our federal budget to actually return some of it so that we can make both licensed and unlicensed uses. Well, wait a second. I don't know forward. why you have to incentivize them. They work for you. No, um, ab ab yeah, no absolutely. It's, 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 I, no. You don't have to incentivize them at all. You just tell them. No, <laughs> okay. but you see what happens is when you have a system like that, they see only loss rather than opportunity. And we, I think we have to recalibrate it so our incentives align. And any other activity doesn't mm -hmm. happen speedily. And I can say that as someone who's tried to negotiate with all of those entities that hold it today. Well, I suspect the commander in chief could tell the military we're giving up some spectrum because we're going to use it much more efficiently. But let's not go there. I just, my point is it's not a scarce, res we it's, keep it's, thinking it's not it's scarce. Not as, it's not as scarce as we think it is. Right. We created a lot of that scarcity the with scarcity the way we distributed it out. Yeah. And so how do we start remaking our spectrum chart. Or moving higher up. And moving it. higher up. And yeah. in fact, that's a huge opportunity, particularly for urban areas. And that putting are in micro cells. Yes. And putting, it's, uh, there are a lot of ways to do it. And I think it's resolve. It's not, I, I, I started a paper called The Sky Is Not the Limit. Because that's not the limit. We are not limited by that. OK, so we're not limited by spectrum. We're not really limited by money. So why the hell isn't the world connected? And you, you look at this and you say, there's, it's really, there's, it's something, is, is, it's gone. I'll, t I'll tell you what it, what it is, what I think it is. And I'll even tell you, if we have time, what I think I'm doing about it. And this part, let me warn you, is the almost un-American part of my <laughs> competition. Because it's really, the subtitle is Competition is Not Democracy. And we have created a state of competitiveness that we take for granted. And at your presentation this mm -hmm. morning, the person from Comcast said that the monopolistic and non-competitive systems were far more efficient than his and far more cost effective than his. And I went up to him afterwards. I said, did you really mean to say that? And he said, yes. And so I thought for a second, wow, that's the problem. How do you get this out, get connectivity out of this competitive dog-eat-dog -dog solution and that we always have to have duopolies, that we have to share towers, that we have to do all? That's holding us back. That's holding us back enormously. And we don't do that and I'll, I'm going to go, if you think I've been on thin ice, wait till you see this. Um, I like to make education an analogy that, that it's a civic responsibility. And if you look at this country, the biggest problem public education has is private education. Because private education is sucked out of the system, people and teachers and things. And you look at the countries that have the highest scores in education, Guess what? They don't have private schools. And so you look, at, you look at those countries and you say, wait, why don't you have a private school? And you don't have a private school because the public schools are really good. And they have choice of which schools, but they're really good. And so we can keep making our public schools worse 
by making more private schools, and private schools presumably are going to be better, and the public schools will get worse. So telecommunication has fallen into that same phenomenon. And there's some, you've got, we've got to break the spell. What are you doing? Are you doing stuff in, the North, in North Africa? You, you, what are your current projects? Was, and are they one laptop? My project is like sort of shooting yourself in the head. My project is uh, to create a new entity at the United Nations. Because there is no entity at the, in the United Nations that's interested in connectivity for the people of this world. There's none. So this is a direct challenge to the ITU. No, 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 no. Uh, the ITU the is a fine regulator. Uh, the ITU is like the FCC the at ITU's, a global level. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a not, different organization. It's a, it's a regulatory body. Um, in, in analogy, the World Food Program is the best analogy. The World Food Program feeds 50 million people a day. They have trucks, they have drivers, they go in first, they come out last. A few of them die every month in the field. It's, it's a real commando group. And they, they, they operate. Their ITU equivalent is called the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, which is a perfectly fine, again, regulatory information research body. So just like those two cohabitate, they don't even report to the same people at the UN, connectivity is missing a world food program. It's missing a program that at the extreme, and I don't, let me just say what the extreme is, but maybe not advocate it, be a global operator for free service. And at a minimum, again, the other extreme, um, simply advocate for connectivity as a civil right or maybe even a human right. And then there are all sorts of things in between that you could do. Now, but the UN does have this stated goal of increasing connectivity by 20. Where's that coming from within the That UN? stated goal, which comes from the Broadband Commission, of which I'm a member, um, I don't know how to be nice. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> it's an embarrassing goal. It's a, but look at the, look at the, uh, the, the whatever they call the sustainable. Uh, what are the new, um, the, the seventeen it's sustainability. What goals. are they called? The goal? yeah. I mean, goals. St st sustainable. Right. So the sustainable. Look at the seventeen. You'll find connectivity. Is appears in seven B paragraph two and thirteen C paragraph. It, it appears three times in sub sub points. It just they it just it's not even recognized. Not have, even in the goals. Have you except. formalized this idea? Is it is it? Public? It's being formalized. Mm -hmm. we, the, see, there are a couple of things happening this year. There's a new secretary general who will mm -hmm. be elected, which is very important. You you want to do it coincident with a new. The new, so, new management. Let me, uh, what about second order effects? Can I ask you if either of you think that the internet played a significant role in the Arab Spring? And if so, um, what might be the unexpected political consequences of connecting the entire world? I certainly watched the Arab Spring and watched it somewhat enthusiastically, but not particularly surprised that it didn't gain momentum and, and, and stick around. But the connectivity uh, you know, continues in many ways. If you look at something as seemingly trivial as the consumption of TED Talks, of which there are two billion now uh, views, uh, it's a, and you look at where they're happening, I've met, I've met people in Africa who have said, I, I met one man who says, my wife is very jealous of the TED Talks because I'm always looking at TED Talks. And I thought, wow. And this wasn't a middle class African in Johannesburg. And, and so you, you, you get little samples that are, to me, sort of encouraging. That's on the consumption side, which is mm -hmm. I'm generally against. But in the constructionist side, oh, there's a lot of things happening. You mentioned a statistic right up front. You know, about there are about seven thousand languages in the world, but only five yeah, percent of them really are represented on the internet. And so, while the internet today, as we think of it, or the web, is infused with Western norms, as we push it out, and as individuals across the globe do more than just consume, but they start to create, that's going to change. And 
that's got consequences that are interesting, that are challenging, and I don't think we fully wrapped our hands around them. So uh, a, a bottom-up internet that is, I mean. Yeah, that's uh, well outside of my jurisdiction, <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> So, have either of you engaged with internet.org, Facebook's effort to, to push the internet into the uh, unconnected world? I, I have a, maybe this is a, a question that will be asked tomorrow, but um, why are they thinking about fractional internet connectivity? Are, are you aware of the fact that they want to make just Wikipedia and maybe Facebook? And what, I mean, is that an island strategy or a, a You know, I've signed so many non-disclosure <laughs> agreements and, and so on. There's certain things I, I feel uncomfortable. Internet.org was a terrible mistake. Um, Well-intentioned, badly implemented, and I think that what is normally a relatively dysfunctional federal government in the case of India did exactly the right thing. Exactly the right thing. Um, and I think they know it, and it'll, it'll come around. But I don't look to the inter, to Facebook or Google or Apple or Microsoft to be the movers and changers, partly because they have a set of customers to whom they have to. They have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders to not piss off those customers. Okay, so that's. They're in a, a very different position. I don't have any customers. I don't, I don't have any uh, buddy that I have to be hold to, and you know that. Uh, and it's, it's much easier if you could create a group, and then they would love it. If there was a public, nonprofit, humanitarian entity that could do something as simple as make mapping data available to everybody free, which, interesting enough, it's not. How can you do connectivity and telecommunications work unless you had that? And so just, just something like that could be on the spectrum a little bit up from advocacy. So you can do things. They'll make inventions, important ones. I, I get the sense that both of you feel that the, the, the drone and balloon experiments are going to get caught in, literally in a no man's land. And the, the, scale, the economic scale of satellites will will I mean, if you're looking for a mechanism, it will be the, the internet will reach the unconnected world via satellite. If you want to connect the whole world within three years, let's take a short number. And by the way, there's a, a capacity issue. Satellites are not infinite capacity. Um, so you combination of geos and leos and maybe even some huge budget for launching these things and let's presume you got the orbital slots that were associated with the geos, you could do it very fast that way. But the long term solution, if you want to get a bit from there to there the fastest possible, it's a fiber. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the extreme of terrestrial communications is to lay fibers. So what's between a fiber and a geo? And there's all sorts of things in this terrestrial wireless, and then there are other things you can do, and they're all going to happen. Yeah, I think, I think it is absolutely the more the merrier. Let's explore drones. Let's even explore balloons. There are geopolitical challenges with those. It is different with satellites. But satellite economics are changing in real time, particularly with um, the low Earth orbiting satellites. You know, We've got proposals out there to cover our skies and surrap the globe in thousands of satellites. And if we can bring the cost of satellite construction down and combine it with much lower costs for rocket launches, the economics of moving um, satellites will change significantly and that will have consequences too. And uh, do you agree with Nicholas that the device issue is not the, not the driving yeah, issue any longer? I feel like longer? five years ago, we would talk about devices, devices, device cost. I feel like the cost of devices is coming down. I feel like everyone knows that you know, in their <laughs> personal life. I mean, I, what, what it cost you to buy a flat screen digital TV in this country five to 10 years ago is very, very high relative to what one costs today. For schools, the cost of developing one-to-one -one devices was at one point prohibitive. But we've got a range of devices that are acceptable 
that are extremely low cost right now, and I think that will continue. Uh, Nicholas, did I remember correctly, at one point you felt that the advantage of a laptop, the, the, the form factor of a device was, well, I guess you... Oh, yeah, no, you, I'm a great uh, believer in the form factor. But tablets are with... Well, tablets are generally a mistake in education because it's a consumption device. And so anybody who has a paternalistic view of education where you're delivering material <laughs> to kids and that's education, <laughs> then buy a tablet, be my guest. <laughs> if you think that kids learn by doing and making and you believe, as I do, that, that writing computer programs is learning how to think, it's nothing to do with getting a job in the future. It's about thinking. And so kids should be able to construct and make and write programs. And that is sort of defined by the width of their hands. So and kids are have smaller hands than we do. So eight or nine inches works. But for the time being, I happen to support things that have keyboards and screens. Yeah. Whether you detach the screen and walk off and call it a tablet or whether it folds down, you know, it probably should run on an open source system of some sort, and it'll, it's just fine. We have about 10 minutes. Why don't I see if I can include the audience? If, if there are comments or questions, um, there are microphone people. Raise your hand, and I'll, I'll call on you. There's a, a gentleman in the dark shirt. Thank you. Uh, I'm Mike Tenafos. I'm with uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and we're one of the world's two largest uh, Wi-Fi providers. There's an initiative underway by the carriers to um, basically grab some of the ISM band mm -hmm. for LTE-like mm -hmm. services. And uh, I'm curious what your perspective is on that. I, I know industry is lined up uh, pro and, and against, but I'm curious about your perspective, FCC. Are you talking about LTEU or, yes. Um, well, the success of Wi-Fi has gone noticed by some of our major network operators who are looking to come up with technologies that would allow them to use some more of it. And uh, that is challenging for those who rely on unlicensed spectrum today as well. So there are tests that are ongoing. The FCC has actually opened up a proceeding to take in some comments on this, and we have given some special temporary authorities for tests. But in general, I think that that conversation has slowed down a bit. And most of the focus right now is moved to 5G and millimeter wave technologies. Um, we are going to continue to monitor those tests, but we have not, for instance, approved equipment yet that actually relates to the technology you're describing. Other Can I just make a comment about mm -hmm. the 5G people in general, and the people who push 5G, which is fine, but, uh, but they tend to be the carriers who want it. Mm -hmm. And they have a core concept that we don't question often enough, and that's called the subscriber. They have designed these <laughs> systems to have subscribers. Wi-Fi doesn't. That's right. And the only time you have to subscribe is when you're paying a user's price in your hotel because mm -hmm. the hotel is so stupid they outsource the <laughs> Wi-Fi and you get paid, you have to pay extra. But normally there's no subscriber. And subscriberless telecommunications is the future, not subscriber and, and so you know, when you're talking about 5G and really high yeah. millimeter wave band spectrum, we do have unlicensed spectrum near about 60 gigahertz, and we have proposed to add a whole bunch more in the same space, which will create really wide channels, and I think the opportunity for new cool things with unlicensed. And yeah. every time we engage in licensed spectrum policy, I think we should have what I call a Wi-Fi dividend. That there should be yeah. a, a public slice, and we should start thinking as a matter of how we manage our airwaves, that there is a unlicensed dividend mm -hmm. or Wi-Fi mm -hmm. dividend every time we proceed. Well, that's one way. It's, it's, it's a little bit like you're about to send to sell Central Park, and you say, well, we should keep a few square feet of it. I, mean, well, I would say don't sell it at right. all. Make so it no, all no, open. And I, I would, I would invite your help on yeah. figuring out the budgeting problems associated with um, a legislative interest in continuing a licensed they spectrum just have policy. Stopped doing that. Just today, the United States was ranked number 18 in the quality of life 
Did you see these rankings that come? I just can't, the one for, the, I forget there's a better name for what the, and we got, we came in 18. Okay, it's, uh, it's and, and we're going down every year. So it's, it's, you know, the value of connectivity isn't necessarily GDP. It's a lot of other things that, that make for the quality of life. And I think people have to keep that in mind. And telecommunications is a major part. All you need to do is have Wi-Fi go out in your home and you know what happens to the quality of life. And uh, it's There's bad. a question at the very back. Hi, I'm Khan with San Jose, California. I'm really excited and inspired by the notion of um, connecting the world globally, right? I think one of the aspects of it that I'm unclear about is who provides the customer support when you can't get on spectrums such as Wi-Fi? You know, as a city, we try to do that type of work. We try to provide it, but there's no, exp uh, I guess there's no um, standard of expectation of service mm -hmm. when it's on a Wi-Fi, right? I'm not going to call my council member. I'm not going to call my mayor. Who do I call when it's free and available, but I can't get on? Well, I'm a great fan of metropolitan Wi-Fi systems, and uh, they've been going down. And there's even some legislation to make them go further. Maybe it's state by state, but there's state. some federal yeah. there's some federal group to basically discourage metropolitan systems. It's, it's state by state. It's state by state. Well, then, okay. So, I, but there's a long list of states yes. doing it right now, or ha have, or which is incredible. But one of the ways you can do support in systems that have a community and it's not just an 800 number that gets you to the to whomever comcast or time warner is is by the people on the system helping the other people on the system and we found in the developing world when other people needed help they got help from other people on the system and if you're even in a even in a village, somebody figured something out, as long as you had 10 people. There had to be minimum 10 people. But it really, these systems can support themselves with the users, not the provider. They really can. Um, by the way, I, I was the ISP for a little <laughs> Greek island uh, that had 2,900 full-time inhabitants 40,000 during the summer. And I put this in way, 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 way back and put wireless through the village. This is in the early 90s. I mean, this is, this is when Wi-Fi things weren't even built in. You had dongles hanging out. <laughs> and the person running the, the, the system for me on the island, believe it or not, um, he died. And when he died, the system continued for four years with no human intervention. <laughs> Nobody, the, the room was locked, okay? And there, there was, it ran for four years before, you know, it, it's, I got, it's a power outage and it didn't self-reboot or something. So these things are pretty robust and they sort of, people, are, people help each other. A, a question in the front, there's the microphone. Ryan Phelan. Um, Nicholas, the statistics that have been used uh, today, the number of people who do not have access to connectivity, I'm just curious, are they really, is it really because they don't have internet access or because they don't have the instruments to get on the online if they had it? And I'm just wondering, if everybody had access, right. would you be up here doing the same thing, saying now we need to get them the hardware to access it. No, I, um, th let me tell you something about the numbers, first of all, because the numbers are, are really, it's very hard to count. So for example, if a, a remote school in an African country has limited internet connectivity with two laptops in the school that 300 kids share, do you count those as 300 users? If you have a kiosk in a village in India that has, I don't know, 60 people in the village, are those 60 connected people? So if you look at the numbers on the largest, I count all of them, count all of them, count all of them, you'll find that one billion people are not connected. 
And if you count none of them, none of them, none of them, you do on the low side, you'll find as many as three billion people aren't connected. So it's kind of this, it's, it's kind of this elastic, and if I want to make a case for how few people are connected, I'll talk about the three billion, and if I want to make a case for, you know, we're not doing so badly, I'll talk about the one billion. And I'm being ballpark, but it's so, it's so elastic. And now the presence of cell phones, I don't think that that's a great, you know, form factor for kids to read books and stuff, but I read books on it now. Mm -hmm. um, the world produces more smartphones per year than there are people. So if we're producing seven billion handsets per year, you know, how often are you changing yours? And so you're now getting that the, I think the world average is close to two. Uh, the amount of cell phones per person in the world. I think it's very close to two. So why aren't they evenly distributed? Why, why aren't they trickling Well, down? that's because you have four. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still in my closet. I right. Have to get... And they're in your closet. <laughs> but it's, it's surprising how many are, yeah. are getting out there. Is there a last question? The woman in black at the back? Hi. Um, so I actually, I was with Mr. Negroponte at an event at the UN in September where we were talking with developing ministers about how does it, you know, in terms of what Were you do at they the need. broadband commission? I was exactly oh. right. So anyway, so the question, you know, to me still from that convening and others in terms of your model for developing really a global program is this idea that funds generally, even coming from, you know, basically ministries that are in charge of this, are being usurped in other ways. Universal service funds is an example that you keep hearing over and over again, but that's, that's also go come and gone at this point. I mean, the question still is, who is prioritizing that? And even if they did it on a national level, you could then sort of think about, okay, who are three or four program providers that kind of have global reach and scale? But the idea still is it's not making it to the top. And I think that's the, the thing that ultimately what we have found working on this is that the economic argument is the one that still people pay the most attention to. And if you can't prove it in terms of saying this is what's going to be related to your GDP growth, there's just no interest otherwise. Um, Can you tell who the group, the group who we is? Yeah, sure. Sorry, I work for the State Department. So, um, and I actually work on connectivity issues. So, Got and uh, we were part of a delegation that included, you know, the ITU and others uh, as part of this uh, broadband commission convening. But bottom line is, it felt like from that conversation and others that has happened subsequently is there is a need for the program. There is a want for the program but the people who need to then fund this stuff are not part of these conversations. So do you guys have any parting thoughts on how to get them into that conversation? Well, I, I don't quite know where to start because the Broadband Commission for, nobody should, should know this, is, is co-chaired by Carlos Slim, who is usually either number one or two on the richest people of the world. Um, made all his money in telecommunications. Um, and Paul Kagame, who's the president of Rwanda, perfectly wonderful man. But neither of these people are qualified, and Carlos has a conflict of interest in being the, the broadband commission for the United Nations. <laughs> so you have a really odd setup there. And then you look at who's around the table, and it's a little bit, my analogy is, is we're going to have a commission that will study the future of private education, and we're going to invite all the, sorry, public education, and we're going to invite all the private headmasters and people, and we'll invite Pearson, who sells books to them, and we'll invite, we'll invite all the people who are feeding this system. That's not a way to rethink public education. So the people in the room are the wrong people. And until that's fixed, in the State Department, I just went to a meeting, and the, I don't think it was you, somebody said, um, all I know is it's competition. Huh? All I know is it isn't competition. And please get the State Department, now that I have no nepotistic relationship to it, to stop doing that. It's not about competition. It's about a new kind of benevolent monopoly. And on that note, Jessica and Nicholas, onward to spectrum experiments and to the UN. Thank you very much. Thank Give them a hand.